So today start something new right here. You might have read this and thought, what in the world is liar, lunatic Lord? Well, um, C.S. Lewis was one of the most profound thinkers of the 20th century. And he once made this statement that echoed through the halls of faith and reason about Jesus. And this is what he said. He said, Jesus was either a liar, a lunatic, or the Lord. Now, that's kind of an offensive statement, really, to suggest that he could be a liar or a lunatic. And even unbelievers will say, you know, it's kind of harsh. You know, Jesus, they will say he was a great teacher. Uh, he was a pacifist. You know, he taught love and he brought people together and he accepted people. And that his followers tried to elevate him to God status. Uh, but he certainly wasn't a liar and definitely not a lunatic. But Jesus really doesn't make room for that kind of neutral ground. If you really uh, get past your feels, you know, we're all into our feels, aren't we? I feel this way, I feel that. If you get past your feels and get into the truth, Jesus doesn't make room for you to be neutral about him. I mean, he claimed to be the son of God, that he could forgive sins. He said that you can't get to heaven or to the father except coming through him. That's kind of a big deal. He said there's no life uh, and there, there's no uh, truth apart from him. So if that's true, like he couldn't just be a nice teacher and nothing else. You really do have to make a choice because if Jesus said all these things about himself and he knew they were not true, that makes him a liar. But if on the other hand, that was not true, but he just thought it was true, that makes him a lunatic. But if Jesus wasn't a liar, and he wasn't a lunatic. The only thing left is he must have been the Lord of all. Yeah. And that's the question we're going to examine over the next four weeks. All through the rest of this month, there's five Sundays and all, all four of the remaining Sundays, we're going to look into this statement and answer the most important question in all of human history. And that is, who is Jesus Christ? You have to make a choice. Uh, C.S. Lewis went on to say this, that Christianity, if false is of no importance. And if true, it's of infinite importance. The only thing it can't be is moderately important. Jesus is the most divisive figure in all of human history. And I love this statement as I was, I, I, I was kind of acquainted or reacquainted with this statement a few weeks ago, kind of filed it away and I knew I wanted to go here. It took me back to the way I was thinking when I was trying to decide what I was gonna do with my life. What would I do and where would I go? And, and this reasoning is what led me to a lifetime of ministry. I, I remember I, I, didn't, I didn't go into ministry like a lot of my peers did. Um, I had some friends and uh, two cousins, you know, that I, I'm not as motivated emotionally as a lot of preachers are, you know. Another way to say that is I'm not as nice as a lot of preachers are, but whatever. We'll, we'll stick with motivated, okay? Uh, but they go away to camp. They have this big youth camp moment. Oh, this is what I'm supposed to do with my life. I'm going to be a preacher. I didn't have that moment. For me, I was more of a thinker and a processor. And my mindset kind of eventually, although I'd never read C.S. Lewis as a child, I kind of got to this right here. And I realized that, like, if 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 this is really true, all this stuff about Jesus is true, then it's the most important thing I could ever do with my life would be to serve him. And, and if all of this stuff is not true, I'll never go back to church a day in my life because it's useless entirely. And, and that, that kind of fits to what the Bible says in the book of Revelation, the, the 66th and final book of, of the Bible, says God says, I wish you were hot or cold. But if you're lukewarm and you're in the middle, he literally said it makes me sick to my stomach and I'll spit you out of my mouth. And, and I, I looked at it the same way. I didn't know that verse either, by the way. I was just a teenager trying to figure it out. But I, I looked at it the same way that if this is true, then it's worth everything I have. It's worth my whole life and my future. And if it's not true, the whole thing's a hoax and I'll never come back, you know. But a Christian doesn't have to suspend their intellect or their thinking to be a follower of Jesus. Actually, the more you honestly investigate the story of Jesus, the story of the creation, the story of the Bible, the more clear it becomes to you. Now, when you go to investigate, you got to be really careful that you don't let Google be your source of investigation because Google is not a believer, nor is Google trustworthy. I know it was true. I read it on the internet. Yeah, you, you, can't let, you can't let that be your researcher. 
But in a, in a community of faith and with like-minded people who are not lemmings and mindless, dumb uh, robots, but are truly seeking out truth, you'll get to truth that will change your life. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing the word of God. Your faith grows, it's built, it's solidified, it is stabilized when you hear the word of God and here's how you hear it in community. You're in a community right now. You're not the only one in the room, you're not on a mountain trying to figure it out by yourself. You've got other people to challenge your assertions. When you make bold statements, they hold you to those statements. That's called accountability. That's fantastic. That's the way God designed it. And if you read the book of Acts, you'll find out God wanted you to have community in at least two ways. Number one, like this right here where we all gather together and rally around the presence of God and the word of God. I think we do a great job of that. Man, I feel God's presence in worship and we get into God's word in the message. Can I hear an amen? But the New Testament also says they gathered from house to house in small groups and we want to follow that same model and that is why this is a church of groups. It's not a church that's got a program that's called small groups that you can sort of choose. It's a church that's built on groups. And today is small group Sunday where there's over 100 options for you to choose from. And that's how you grow in community. You have to learn how to get along with the other people. You know, like you learn, you listen, you, you're challenged and, 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 and your, your faith is built that way. So I want to encourage you to get in a small group today, okay? You can go in the lobby at every campus, talk to somebody there, or go online to the website. That, that, it's a QR code that you can, you can check out. But there's all these options. My advice is read every single small group and join like three, all right? And then you're going to find out one is like, nope, I don't like that one. Just drop it. Tell them we love you, but I'm going to a different one. They won't take it personally, okay? And if you're the leader, don't take it personally, all right? Because I just gave everybody advice to quit you, okay? And, and, and find the one that's right for you and grow together. If you got that, everybody say amen. amen. All right, let me give you one more C.S. Lewis quote, and then we'll be done with him for today. All right, but we're going to get back on him next week, okay? One more from C.S. Lewis. He says, you must make your choice. Either this man Jesus was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. That's how stark the question is. And I believe the most important question in all of human history is who is Jesus Christ? Who is he? All of history is split on the birth of Jesus. Every time you fill out an application for anything and you put your date of birth, you are testifying that Jesus was born this many years and days before I was born. Do you understand that? <laughs> the most staunch atheist testifies to the birth of Jesus when he writes the date, today's date, on a check. Okay? You cannot just say, well, Jesus is like Muhammad, Buddha, all these. No, no. He split history. He is the defining figure of all of humanity. You have to decide. He can't just be a nice guy who taught a few nice things and you ought to pick some of his and pick some of mine and pick some of Oprah's and pick some of what's popular in your favorite movie. He won't be cafeteria style faith. He's a liar or he's a lunatic and if he's not one of those, he is the Lord of heaven and earth, the creator of all things. By the way, I'll go ahead and get you to the end of the story. That's who he is. I'm sorry I couldn't wait to the end to get us there. Spoiler alert, I believe he's the Lord. And the verse that we're looking at in kids' church and here today, all right, uh, this is big church, by the way. If you didn't know it, you're in big church. Over there, they call us big church. We're big church. Okay. All right, um, here's the verse we're looking at across the, the whole church. Matthew chapter 1, it speaks to the deity of Jesus, how he was born. It says she, meaning Mary, will have a son, and you'll name him Jesus. Just a regular name, okay? Jesus, normal name. It's not messianic. It's just the name of Jesus, okay? All right. He is the Christ, and Christ was his designation. It wasn't his last name. You understand that? Jesus Christ. Christ means the Savior of the world. You're going to name him Jesus, for he'll save the people from their sins. And all of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, here's what the prophet said. The prophet was Isaiah. They're quoting Isaiah. He said this 700 years before Jesus was born. Look, the virgin will conceive. Time out, all right? Everybody's like most of you know the Christmas story. You've been to like some Christmas play or something. or You, you, you know this verse. 
I need you to try to think like you have never heard this verse before. Try to erase it from your brain for one second. And look at this phrase right here. The virgin will conceive. That's utterly ridiculous. You, you understand? This is why Christianity, you can't just kind of float in and out of it. You got to go all in or get out. <laughs> Because you got to believe crazy things like a virgin can conceive and have a child. And she will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel. Okay, back over here at the first half, he's just going to be Jesus. That means uh, Jehovah, it's, it's a great name, but a lot of people could be named Jesus. Now all of a sudden, he's going to be Emmanuel. That means God is with us. All of a sudden, we begin to make claims about this you know, this uh, conceived child that are unbelievable. Uh, and, 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 you know, Hollywood would never make a movie like this. Uh, it, no one would ever invent an idea like this and make it into a novel. It's, it defies biology. It, it couldn't possibly ever happen. Actually, you have to believe that Jesus is the Lord or all of this is a lie. Now, there was a famous atheist named uh, Bertrand Russell, atheist philosopher. And he said simply, if there is no God... There's no right and there's no wrong. Now, he didn't believe in God, but he believed if there was no God, there couldn't be a right and wrong. The, the, the obvious reality is there's no anchor. There's no one to draw a line in the sand and say, this is right, this is wrong, this is good, this is evil. And so when that happens, we are all left to determine what is right in our own eyes. The Bible actually predicted that we'd get to that place. Did you know that's prophetic in the Bible, that we're going to reach that day? And have we not reached that day? We just wake up every day and there's a new set of right and wrongs. Somebody told political parties and pop culture icons and social media influencers and, and, and famous media types what the new right and wrong was and the rest of us just got to figure it out and go along with it. And if you don't go along with it, you're racist, bigoted, crazy, religious, nut jobs. Are, are you living in the world I'm living in? That's exactly what the Bible predicted would happen. And when you take God away, everybody just does what feels right. Now, the incarnation, that word is a, uh, it's, it's a religious word, but it means God becoming flesh. The incarnation clarifies what Christianity is all about. Now, th this world doesn't understand Christianity, and a lot of Christians don't understand Christianity. Th there's a, a, a popular belief, pop culture belief, that Christianity is a set of right and wrong. Values, integrity, righteousness, long-suffering, love, compassion, really, really good things. But that Christianity says, do these things and you'll become a Christian. And if you do more of those really good things than you do of the bad things in your life, then when, when, when it's all over, you get to go to heaven. And so just make sure that before it's over, you do more good things than all the bad things you've done. That's why you have so many people getting really, really nice at the end of their life. <laughs> and y'all got grandparents that are so nice to your children, and you're like, these are not the people that raised me. <laughs> and you're like, they're trying to get into heaven. I know what it is. They're trying to... <laughs> You know, they're trying to come around that, that fourth turn and get there in time, right? And, and, and so we live in this way where, like, if we swear at our children this week, we, we want to even that out and do something nice, and we buy them something, or we put more money in the offering, and we try to cancel out the bad deed. You, you lie to a coworker this week, you try to do a good deed to cancel it out, and you hope that you've done more good than bad at the end. That is not what Christianity is about at all. If that's what Christianity was about, then we don't need a virgin birth, we don't need God to come to earth. Actually, what Christianity teaches is that God is holy and he's perfect and you and I never will be. We can't get there. We can't even live up to our own standards. Can I hear an amen to that? How could we ever live up to God's standards? And since I couldn't get to God, he came to me. He came and lived a perfect life and showed me the gap between my righteousness and his righteousness. Knowing I could never get there, he shed his blood, his perfect blood for my imperfect sin now perfected me through the eyes of God and brought me to God. And that relationship with God doesn't die when my natural body dies. It continues into eternity. And because of what Jesus did on the cross, I can be perfected in him and I can be in the presence of God for all eternity. That's the only way I can get there. That, in a nutshell, is the greatest story ever told. And the question is, is it just a story or is it the truth? Is it real? 
1 Peter, Peter writes in 1 Peter 3, he says, everyone, every believer must be ready at any time to give a reason. Everybody say reason. reason. Give a reason that you have hope in Christ. Can you give that reason? Somebody sees you walk out of church. Somebody sees you at lunch and sees you pray over your meal and, and, and an atheist or just a seeker, a hungry person trying to figure out their life comes and says, give me a reason for this prayer. Can you give a reason? I want to help you that today. I want to give you what I'm calling evidence of the divine. Let me refer you to a book called The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. It's a fantastic book uh, by a, a New York Times Pulitzer Prize winning atheist turned Christian. All right. But let me, let me just give you these four evidences of the divine. And here's the first one. Eyewitness testimony. You go to court. Your lawyer says this is how it happened. The other lawyer says this is how it happened. And the judge has one question. He says, I want to know who saw it. Give me eyewitness testimony. Let's talk about Jesus. Who saw Jesus? Who met him? Who listened to his parables and his teaching? Who saw him forgive sin and heal people and perform miracles? Who saw him raise dead people back to life? Who saw him die on a cross, right? Who, who saw the empty tomb? And who saw him, most importantly, alive after he was dead? Well, the good news is there's several people over 500 that we know of. And several of them wrote their account of what they saw and it survived history. People like Matthew who used to be a tax collector. He met Jesus. He wrote all down what he saw and, and, and Mark and Luke who was a local physician and he wrote everything he saw. And then John and, and James and Peter and then, and then uh, Paul who didn't believe in the Messiahship of Jesus initially. He was trying to shut the whole thing down but he met a risen Savior. How many of you know, like, even if you don't believe that someone could come back to life, if you watch them die and watch them live, you kind of become a believer. <laughs> Paul wrote all about it because he saw it with his own eyes. He was fully against it, and then all of a sudden, he was fully for it. And the good news is, we have eyewitness testimony. They wrote what they saw, just like Peter said this. He said, for we were not making up clever stories when we told you about the powerful coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Say it with me. We saw his majestic splendor with our own eyes. These were not popular, just self-promoting statements like in our world today. All of a sudden, something will become popular, and politicians will say it, and then you know, movie stars and pop culture icons will say it, and everybody, all of a sudden, it just becomes like a, a popular thing that everybody's into all of a sudden, like, like gender is fluid. All of a sudden, everybody decided gender is fluid. You can pick your gender, and now, if you don't say gender is fluid, you're bigoted and hateful, and you know, it's just like, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, like you never heard that in your whole life, and now all of a sudden, everybody's saying it. That's not what this was. This was not popular. This was not famous. In fact, these, it was the exact opposite. These are the kind of words that got Peter's family murdered and Peter crucified upside down. But here's what he said. He says, I saw it with my own eyes. And my favorite such account in the whole Bible is when John explains it like this in the, in the, the first verse of 1 John. He, it's so poetic the way he says it. He says, that which was from the beginning... That which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and which our hands have what? And we've touched it. We touched it with our hands. Concerning the word of life, the life was manifested. And that means it was right in front of us. And we have seen, he keeps saying it. We have seen it and we bear witness and we declare to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifest, was right in front of us. Again, he says it, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you may also have fellowship with us. Why is that important? Because truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write to you so that your joy may be full. You know what he was saying? He wasn't making this up because he wanted to become famous. In fact, he never became famous until his death. He, he wasn't saying this so he would uh, curry favor with people. This got him on the, the radar and on the target of all the people of authority. What he was saying was, I can't stop telling you what I saw with my eyes and I heard with my ears and I touched with my hands. This man was dead and he came back alive. I don't care what you do to me. I don't care what you say about me. I'll not stop saying Jesus Christ is the risen Savior of the world. You have people 
dozens of people who wrote it, said it. These are people who, listen, many of them were murdered by the Romans. They were trying to stamp out what they thought was going to be a physical rebellion. They took the early Christians and hung them on post and turned them into street lights to light up the city as they put gas on them and burned them at the stake to light their, the city with their corpses. These people didn't make this up to be popular or to establish a church like in America where it's a good thing to go to church and people look up to a pastor. It was the complete opposite in that day. But they said, I can't help but tell you what I saw with my eyes and what I heard with my ears. Now, some people will tell you that's a good story, but you can't trust the Bible. Those accounts are written 100 years later, 80 years later. You can't trust legend and mythology grew, and that's actually not the words anymore. But actually, did you know you can date back the earliest biographies of Jesus to within 30 years of his life? The people who lived with him, who established early churches, finally settled down and began to write everything. They had notes. You can tell that they shared notes of the events and what happened in their lives. And historians will tell you that you, it's too close for legend to corrupt the story. In fact, even earlier than that, the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth some words that actually became an early church creed. It's used in creeds today, but it was used in the early church. 1 Corinthians 15 says, he says in verse 3, I passed on to you what was the most important and what also had been passed on to me. Here's where the creed begins. Christ died for our sins, just as scriptures said. He was buried he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as scriptures, he's talking about Old Testament scriptures, said. He was seen by Peter and then by the 12. After that, he was seen by more than 500 followers at one time, most of whom are still alive. You can go find them. Go ask them yourself, though some have died. Then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. And last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. Did you know that we can date back that creed to within 24 to 36 months after the resurrection of Jesus? They were quoting that creed in different churches. Legend has no time to grow in 24 months. You can't rewrite that story that quickly. Dr. Ian Sharon White was an Oxford University uh, historian from England, and he's known as the greatest classical historian ever. Here's what he says about those early accounts of Jesus. He says, two generations of time, that would be 80 years, is not even enough for the legend to grow up and wipe out the solid core of historical truth. In other words, the, we start seeing this story spread immediately. There's no way it could have been changed that rapidly. Another scholar named F.F. F. Bruce said, had there been any tendency by the disciples to depart from the facts in any material way, the possible presence of hostile witnesses, people who would discount it in an audience would have served as a corrective. So that's uh, scholarly speak. Let me put it in modern terms. Like He says, you can't change the story because everybody saw the story. It's like if I came up here today and said, guys, you know, Nick Saban retired last year. After winning his eighth national championship, beating Michigan, he went out on top. Now, many of you Bama fans would say, row tight. <laughs> but you Auburn people would be like, okay, y'all. It wasn't, that ain't how it happened. <laughs> Michigan beat him. I saw that game on TV myself. Right, you know, you can't make up stories like that when so many people saw the story. And that's the same thing this historian is saying. There's just no way this message gets changed because there were too many people who saw it. If it could have been changed, the Romans certainly would have changed it, right? They would have loved to change it. They would have loved to, the Jews would have loved to have changed it, but it had universal acceptance because everyone saw the same thing. Here's your second reason that you can trust the divine of Jesus, and that's the disciples. This is the reason for me when I was a college student and I had my greatest battle of faith, I came back to the story of the disciples. Every one of them were brutally murdered, and why would they take that to cover up a lie? They were tortured and killed, and there are historical documents outside of the Bible that show that to us. And, and the argument might be, well, crazy people have, have died for crazy things 
for many years. That's, no, that's nothing new. Crazy people die for crazy. The 9-11 terrorists, remember that? They flew a plane uh, into uh, a building and they believed that the moment they were incinerated by the jet fuel that they were in paradise. But here's the difference. These disciples saw Jesus. They talked to him. They touched him. They ate with him. They knew if it was a lie or not, and, and they wouldn't have died for what they knew to be a lie. They wouldn't have told us we saw him, we touched him, and then died for a lie. People have died for what they believed in, but there's nowhere in recorded history where someone knows it's a lie, and they're tortured, and they die to preserve a lie. It just doesn't add up. Y'all, I, wanted, I tried to be an atheist. I, I thought about it one time. I just don't have enough faith to be an atheist. I can't get there. You got to believe too many crazy things to be an atheist. You got to discount so much obvious evidence that God is God. Here's the third evidence we have is the fulfillment of prophecy. There is a mountain of prophecy about Jesus. Mountains of stories. The different writers across 1,100 years, 11 centuries, from different parts of uh, the known world at the time are all writing in different languages different things about who Jesus would be. In the Old Testament alone, we have about 50 to 60 specific predictions just about his birth. And his birth fulfilled them all. Things like where he would be born and who would be there and whose family he would come out of and, and, and all these different prophecies. In fact, there's a, a famous book written by Dr. Peter Stoner, University of California uh, mathematics professor. He took on a project uh, of, of examining the probability of these prophecies of Jesus. He had a whole group of grad students in mathematics and they were studying probabilities. And so you, you can actually find probabilities of things like when, when, when Micah in the Old Testament said that Jesus, the, the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Well, you can figure out the probabilities of that, how many people were born in Bethlehem over a period of time, and it kind of raises the probabilities. And then when you add to that all these other things that had to be true, so they started trying to get a number of the probability of these prophecies working out, and they only could get to eight. After examining eight of the, pro of the prophecies of Jesus, they determined mathematical odds that someone could fulfill all eight of these, and it wasn't one in a million, and it wasn't one in a billion, and it wasn't one in a trillion, the mathematical probability was one in a hundred million billion. That's a one with 17 zeros after it. And there are, that's just eight of the prophecies. There are 300 prophecies about Jesus published over 11 centuries, uh, and, and they ended four centuries before Jesus was born. There was nobody there to go, see, now here's what I told you. Did you notice that? Th those, everybody who wrote those prophecies were dead and gone. They'd been dead for 400 years. Nobody's looking for it. Nobody's uh, expecting it. Nobody's trying to create it in the moment. It was a true God thing. They go into such detail. Someone like Isaiah told us that he'd be born of a virgin. Somebody like Micah told us he'd be born in Bethlehem. We have Moses who said he would be of the tribe of Judah. Jeremiah said he's of the house of David. David told about his betrayal in Psalm 22 and how people would betray him. And he dictates the, uh, the, the whole narrative of the crucifixion. Even though David had never seen a crucifixion. No one, because there'd never been a crucifixion 700 years before Jesus was born. And yet it's detailed in scripture in a different language in a different part of the world. In fact, in one day alone, the day Jesus was taken to be crucified, he fulfilled 28 separate prophecies from six different prophets. And the more research that is done on this subject, the more obvious it becomes, y'all. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He died on a cross like the scripture said he was going to die hundreds of years before. He, they killed him just like David said they were going to kill him. He rose just on the exact day that scripture said he was going to rise. He was seen by 500 people. Y'all, he's the son of God. The evidence is in. The verdict is clear. Jesus Christ is the risen savior of the world. Does anybody believe that besides me? It's true. It's clear. And I don't have enough faith to believe the other story. It had to be this way. Let me give you one more in closing, and that's the resurrection. Did you know there is actual evidence of the resurrection that he rose from the dead? So there was a, a famous world's greatest trial lawyer. His name was Lionel Rucco. He's from England. He's in the Guinness Book of World Records. He 
successfully defended people who had been arrested and tried for murder. 245 straight cases he won. He was an incredible, greatest lawyer. He's like the real Perry Mason, you know, in real life. He went on to service to the, uh, to the kingdom of the United Kingdom. He was knighted twice by Queen Elizabeth. He was a diplomat. He was a super, really smart guy. And someone thought in his day, what would it be like if the greatest legal mind ever were to examine the evidence of the resurrection and put Jesus' resurrection on trial and, and give us a verdict? Well, he was publicly challenged to do that, and he took the challenge. It actually happened. He took several years to examine all the biblical evidence, historical evidence, uh, everything that he could find, medical evidence surrounding what the Bible says happened to Jesus' body. And he, he came down to this verdict. Here's what he said. Famous statement from Sir Lionel Rucco. He said, I say unequivocally that the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so overwhelming that it compels acceptance by proof that leads, leaves absolutely no room for doubt. Yeah. This man was an atheist. But after this project, he accepted Jesus and became a follower of Jesus for the rest of his life. When you get past all of the pushback and you get to the core of what our Bible says, you, you see the truth is Jesus is who he says he is. And if he is, listen church, if that is true, it's the greatest truth in human history. If it's right, it's the most important thing in human history, not for preachers, but for everyone. For every person ever created they're made in God's image. And the evidence is clear. What's the evidence? Well, he was murdered in front of hundreds of people. Stabbed in the side. He bled out. He died. They, uh, like legal evidence, he has to be dead. They can't take him off that cross until he's dead. They had medical experts to determine he was dead. They put him in a tomb. One historical document said that the rock they put in front of that tomb took 20 men to move. They put a, a troop of soldiers to guard the tomb. If you work for Rome and you fall asleep on the job, they, they kill you in public. They fell asleep on the job somehow. Somehow, a, a, a rock that took 20 men to move were moved without any men helping. The tomb was empty. I've been to the tomb. It's still empty. 515 people saw him alive. If 515 people were brought up here to just to tell you what they saw, and each gave 15 minutes. It'd take 128 hours for everybody to tell you what they saw. That's how much evidence there is that Jesus rose from the dead. People have been put on death row because one person saw them. We have 515 people we know who saw Jesus. Here's the other thing. Nobody had a motive to steal his body. Some people make, they, they sow. You see, people who want to fight against the evidence of Jesus being the Savior of the world, they have a rooting interest. I know you would say, well, of course, you, you have a rooting interest too. You're on the Christian side. But they have a rooting interest for it not to be true because if it is true, it's the most important truth of all. And it demands action from me. And so they come up with ridiculous things like, well, somebody, st the Romans stole his body. If the Romans could have found his body, they would have thrown him in the back of a of a wagon and drug him through the streets of Jerusalem just to let everybody know he's actually dead. Y'all calm down. Cut it out. The Jews wouldn't have stolen his body. They won't touch a dead body. And if they, if they found out he was dead, they just want him to stay dead. All right. Well, the disciples stole his body. Really? What? That's a great game plan. You found out that your Savior was a fraud, so you're going to establish a false religion so they can kill you and all your family members. That's a good idea. I mean, they, they, they boiled John in oil. They, they, they thrust... Uh, one of the disciples with, with a pole in India because he was preaching the truth, hung him on a pole. Others were dragged through the streets behind chariots. No, nobody's making this story up. That's a bad idea. There's, there's, there's no reason for anybody to fake it. And, and church, let me just stop right here. I could nerd out about these facts all day long. I love this story. But what it really comes down to is your own heart. It's not... Uh, intellectual decision it's a heart decision and I want you to know this and I so want you to bring people with you next week I'm going to examine this this Jesus for the whole month of September but know this 
about every person hearing us right now and every person God ever created. He says to all. Everybody say all. all. That really means everyone. Everyone who believes in him and accepts him, he gives the right to become what? Children of God. You, you don't have a friend who can't become a child of God. You, there's nobody in this room that can't become a child of God. There's nobody here that's got to go clean up, fix up, straighten up. It doesn't say that. You just need to believe in him. Well, I can show you 10 more verses that say the same thing. If you believe, you're forgiven. You can be forgiven. You can become a child of God. Well, you just don't know the people I know. You don't know how hardened they are. You don't understand how uh, against it. No, no, let me tell you something. They may be, but God has them on a journey. You better hear my heart. Every person, he's got a plan for them. And here's, here's a, one of those prophets who talked about Jesus. He also prophesied this in Ezekiel 36. He said, I'll give a new heart and put a new spirit in you. And I'll take your stony, stubborn heart. Do you know somebody like that? So anti-God, so against it. Maybe you've been that way yourself. You got a stony, stubborn heart. He said, I'll, I'll take that and I'll give you a tender, responsive heart. You don't know anybody that's too far gone. You don't know anybody that's too distant from God. You bring them here next week. You, you, maybe they won't come in the building. Send them this message electronically. And maybe that somebody is not somebody you know, but it's you yourself. And you're beginning to see. And it's not, it's not the telling of the story from a, a, the lips of a human being. It's the power of the Holy Spirit in this room. Do you know that? There's something special in this room. The Bible says, if two or more gather in my name, I am there I'm among them. You can't see him in this room, but God is in this room. Amen. The Bible says he performs miracles as a confirmation of his word. Each and every week when I get up to preach, what I want is a miracle to happen. A miracle to happen in your life, in your heart, in your mind, in your physical body, in your marriage, in your family, in your finances. And the best way for a miracle to happen is for me to get behind this because a miracle is a confirmation of his word. We have preached his word today. And he's doing a miracle inside somebody's heart.